Good afternoon, everybody. Well, don't stop to see you get what I have to say. And you might have a different opinion by the time we're done. Okay, are you set up now? As most of you know, 20-some years ago, there was federal legislation which restricted funding on firearm violence research through the CDC. So no federal funds were allowed to be used to do any research on, on guns, generally. And so, um, what I'm going to be talking about is sort of what we know right now, and particularly around firearm violence in schools, and particularly around sort of people's concerns around mass shootings that are occurring in schools and other public places and what that means for our approaches to gun violence prevention. So there's things that we do now that I think uh, have some evidence of effectiveness, but we all just, I'm providing the context that there isn't a, a large significant block of research here to go back on for the last 20 years. And it's really over in, in the last 18 months or so that several folks like me around the country are writing about this issue again. And what we have is mostly law enforcement related data on shootings, uh, homicides and suicides and mass shootings, and not a lot of good information about interpersonal gun violence and what to do about it. So that's where we're at. So I'm going to be presenting some things that I've written about some data that's up to date, mostly on um, gun violence uh, nationally. The, the Gun Center does a lot of things. I skipped through that. We, we are a group now of between 50 and 60 individuals, researchers and staff, focusing on a bride, variety of things. Um, we're heavily involved in the heroin opiate epidemic. We're doing uh, DNA testing on sexual assault kits and changing how we address those issues with our law enforcement partners. We're embedded with our colleagues at CMHA, police assisted referral, etc. So to pick up on what Erica said, we are, we are sort of embedded with our community partners in a different way than a lot of academic uh, research centers. Here's a graph um, from a 2019 report by the National Council for Behavioral Health on overall mass shootings in this country from 1966 to 2015. Uh, and I can tell you that the data, I have more recent data than this, and this doesn't include, obviously, some more recent mass shootings at schools that have occurred, Parkland and others. But if you can see anything, you can see that the trend is relatively upward in terms of mass shootings overall. So you have issues like Las Vegas, you've got Dayton, you've got the Garlic Festival in one weekend, you've got the Walmart shooting in El Paso, etc. Most of the formal definitions of what constitutes a mass shooting is four or more victims, uh, homicide victims, in an incident, and they mostly exclude domestic violence situations. So when we talk about mass shootings, they're, they're occurring a lot in places of business, open spaces like the concerts. You see schools is also a place where they have occurred. Uh, which we'll talk more specifically about. We've also had places of worship, as you know, churches and synagogues and other places, unfortunately, in the last number of years. But this is also important, right? Less than 5 percent of these. And in fact, most of the research on school-specific shootings shows that those events are over within two and a half minutes. Well before law enforcement is most able to arrive. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, even before an SRO who may be physically on site is able to intercede, which is what we saw in Parkland, for example. And even in Columbine, there were a couple of SROs in the building at Columbine. So these are, this is 2017 and 2018. So these, uh, these incidents don't last very long, and they, they end pretty quickly from a variety of different things. So they're occurring all over the place. And if you look up in the upper left-hand corner, these active shooter incidents, um, most of them are occurring in cities with a population of under 100,000, and a significant percentage with in locations under 50,000. These are typically not urban schools or institutions. These are suburban and rural locations uh, where these shootings are mostly occurring. We're, we have the distinction of being second on the list of the states with the most incidents in this last 17-year period in Ohio. So what does this show? This shows that 
the distinction between the type, the level of school, high schools versus higher ed, versus middle school and elementary schools. There has been a shift from predominantly elementary, middle school focused school shootings to way more uh, higher increase in higher ed institutions. Okay, again, there are, there are a lot of databases out there now in the last two years where they're trying to compile all these incidents from media reports and other kinds of statistics. So it depends on which report you go to and whether they took the four person victim thing versus just victims versus school was the actual attended site of the incident versus it was a person at the school who was the target and then the incident um, exploded into uh, having other victims who just happened to be nearby. So there are all of those kinds of issues with how we define these incidents and uh, what we do about them. But apprehended by law enforcement, uh, 28 of those incidents in the end. Actually killed by law enforcement, uh, a few of them. We often have perpetrators who are intending to end the incident by suicide or by forcing the issue with law enforcement. So keep that in mind because when we talk about firearm violence, you can't forget suicides. They're right up there with homicides. And many people that perpetrate homicides in these incidents are intent on doing this as a suicidal act. Okay? This is the most recent information we have on a paper that's forthcoming. Um, many of you may know Jamie Foxx, who's a uh, USA Today contributor, Northeastern University professor. Lacey Wallace is at Penn State, who does gun violence policy research. Ed Mulvey is at Pittsburgh, who's sort of the uh, mental health um, person. And Bill Modzaleski, who used to head up the Office of Safe and Drug Free Schools at, at the U.S. Department of Education, was part of the early safe school studies with Secret Service on school shootings and visited most of the school shootings through his time in the department, which ended in 2016. So the total number of incidents and the total number of victims. So again, we have um, Virginia Tech and Parkland that spike the number of victims as opposed to the number of incidents. Um, so again, depending on how you parse this out and, and what you're looking at, K to 12, K to 8, higher ed, this doesn't, um, your graph is going to look a little bit different depending on what you're doing. But the bottom line is that multiple homicide incidents are increasing. Doesn't mean that your rate or the possibility of you becoming a victim of firearm violence at school has gone up. All right, so let keep that in mind. When we talk about violence in schools, there's a continuum here, right? And when we talk about what schools should be doing about this, we have to keep that in mind. That gun violence is way down here in terms of prevalence and occurrence and etc. They're mostly concerned with physical fighting, threats, bullying, and other things, right? When they talk about school safety and security. However, what you're going to see pop up later, so this is a little bit of the cart before the horse, there is a Columbine effect that's gone on in the last 20 years. What's the Columbine effect? Because of what happened in Columbine in the late 1990s, right, that schools now, school superintendents will tell you whether I think that this is a possibility in my school or not, I have to be concerned with how to do everything I can to prevent a mass shooting incident. Because if one were happen to occur in my school or in my school district, I know that that will impact the climate and culture of my school and my community and people's perceptions of fear and safety. The, the consequences of experiencing an incident are so enormous that Superintendents will now tell you, I'm going to do everything I can to prevent this sort of incident, even while I intellectually understand that the chances of it occurring are pretty low. Having said that, I've already shown you, it can sort of happen anywhere, right? It's not like we have a, enough of a incident pool to say, well, if we got these things going on, it's almost, ne it's almost not ever going to happen, because it's been happening all over the place. So we've got to keep that continuum in mind when we talk about what to do about <clears throat> firearm violence and other forms of violence at school. Because when you dig deeper into the data, you look at threats and incidents, 
from school year to school year, threats are way up there and they're sort of exploding. Threats of violent behavior, threats of carrying out a shooting or a violent act with hit lists. And we're reading more and more in the media about successfully averted incidents and plans that people find out about. Right? For a very long time, you heard nothing about incidents that didn't occur. All of the media attention is on whether or not there are multiple victims, not just people who are injured. So you'll still see the one paragraph, you know, school shooting, so many people were injured, the assailant was caught or not. It's only if persons are victims of homicide that you get, and multiple persons victims of homicides that you get the intensive media coverage. So not only has there been an increase in threats in the last couple of years at schools, but there's been a substantial increase in the actual number of incidents that have occurred of violence uh, within a school year. That's, that's over a 100% increase. So that's, there's something going on here under the, you know, it's not just the mass shootings, it's the other things that are contributing to when these things occur. And then when you look at the types of threats, Shooting threats still drive the train here, right? It isn't one third grader making a popsicle stick gun and pointing it at somebody else and saying, I'm going to get you. Uh, it's, it's kids, and usually males, boys, uh, making very specific threats that they're going to shoot someone or a number of people at their school. Um, the gun, guns versus bombs and shooting threats, etc. in 2016 versus 2017-18 has all gone up. And we, we looked at Cleveland data, calls for service, about 15 years ago, and we found the same thing. It was the threats that uh, were increasing substantially. And not always threats between two kids. Sometimes it was a parent threatening a teacher coming into the school, or the, or the parent coming in and threatening another kid. <coughs> Whoops. The most frequent type of incident in 2017-18 was guns found on campus, followed by shots fired, followed by a thwarted plot. So when you're looking at these specific instances of firearm violence at school, uh, we're still seeing a lot of weapons being brought to school. So you talk about the sheer availability of firearms. That gets us into our later discussion about what to do about this. All, all that we know, all of the data I've ever seen says the more guns that are around and available, the more likely there is to be an intentional or unintentional injury, period. Whatever your position is on the Second Amendment, that's what we know. The more guns that are out there, the more stuff happens, accidentally and otherwise, available to people under the influence, available to people who are pissed off. If there's a mental health kernel to all of this, it's anger. Levels of anger, <laughs> impulsivity, etc. So when we talk about what to do about this, we need to keep those things in mind as well. So when you look at rates of school-associated crime and death, your, your possibility of being a victim at school from an incident is less than point, well, point oh seven per 100,000. But when you look at the overall rate of deaths from unintentional injury from all kids, it's 15 to 11 back up to 16. 61% of those deaths unintentional, 20% homicides, 19% suicides. So statistically speaking, schools are still a relatively safe place for our young people. Don't dismiss my comment meaning experiencing a shooting, being threatened with an incident, no, if that happens, it's horrible. We don't want it to happen. But when you look at the number of incidents and the fatality rates, etc., cetera, um, relative to what happens in day-to-day -day life, so to speak, and with firearms and injuries and disputes between two people, your chances of being a victim of a violent crime in school is pretty low. And we, we get into the sort of issues of, is this happening at a school event? Is it happening at or on the way to school? Is it outside of the school grounds? We have a lot of incidents that are happening before and after school, especially with elementary schools contiguous to high schools, for example, and the older kids get out earlier and they hang out and wait for the younger kids to get out of school, and then a lot happens. Incidents that occur because of something that happened at school, or at a sporting event, or things that were going on in social media that spill over. 
into the school. So how much of this is school driven again? As school is the target, school is the place, kids at school are the target, or I, got, I come in because I'm pissed off at somebody and I start shooting and they just happen to be there. That happens quite a bit as well. So there has been an increase in the rate of school shootings in the last few years. So I think um, we're past the blip and we're into a trend in terms of the number of shootings that are occurring at schools. Over half of them have occurred in K-12 schools. There's been an uptick, as you saw earlier, in shootings that are occurring in places of higher education. In the 90s and early 2000s, we had, had almost no incidents at higher education until really Virginia Tech. Um, we also know that when people look at the aggregate numbers by states, school shootings have, states that have lower rates of school shootings have background check laws in place. States that have more spending on mental health and K-12 education have lower rates of school firearm violence and shootings. States with higher percents of urban populations, when you consider all forms of gun violence, have higher rates of school-associated firearm violence. So there is some developing evidence that at the policy level and at the funding level and at what we focus on, we are seeing big differences within states and across countries. When they do the cross-national stuff, the only thing that stands out is the sheer number of firearms that we have when you control for all those things, mental health rates, spending on mental health, spending on education, poverty, etc., we stand out mostly because of the number of firearms that we have available. So multiple homicide incidents get the most attention, but way more shootings occur between two people that you don't ever hear about at schools and in school-associated events. They're now occurring in all types of schools, not just K-8, to K-12, to high school, they're now in higher ed as well. There are some challenges though that we need to talk about, right? We're aggregating still relatively rare events. It's just they're not happening every day, they're happening more frequently, and in fact, in the last 12-month period, we have over 300, I think. So again, depending on how you count them, they're happening uh, more frequently. And we're still left mostly with these qualitative methods of interviewing surviving perpetrators. It's a small percentage of perpetrators who survive. And looking at media accounts and doing our psychological autopsy of the perpetrators. So we have a perception issue here, right? We have a media coverage issue here that people think that this is out of control. And it's increasing, it's a problem, it's significant when it occurs. There are other forms of violence and firearm violence that are way more common. Um, and the, so your rate of being a homicide victim at a school is pretty low and has been stable for decades and pretty rare. So it's also a challenge because we don't classify, other than homicides and suicides, you don't hear a lot about firearm violence. Most schools don't want to report it as a safety issue in their school. And so unless there's an injury or a death, they don't. Or they say, this is a, the football game. You know, it's not in my building. If it's not literally in my building, I'm not going to report it. <coughs> You've all heard of the suicide contagion effect, right? A clustering effect of suicides that occur with increased risk when a person takes, a young person takes his or her own life. There's a clustering effect of their peer group and physical locations where suicides tend to increase and risk for suicides tend to increase. We now know that there's actual data, this is done by a physicist, um, that shows a contagion effect based on the media coverage of mass shootings, and particularly in schools. So they've shown that, and this is a contagion effect of incident, not of location. Right, so when the shootings occurred in Parkland, it wasn't an increased effect of more shootings around Parkland. It's just somebody else reading about that. I'm planning and thinking about this. I'm going to do the one up, or I'm, you know, going to take my next opportunity to be the next person in the media. So there is a statistically significant increase 
over at least 13 days of a likelihood of another school shooting. So when you wrap this into the increased prevalence of these incidents, you look at anniversaries of significant events, you look at media coverage and re-exposure to these incidents and the, and the mental health issues involved around trauma and re-exposure re -exposure to these incidents, um, we're having a cumulative effect that we need to be concerned about. We also have something going on in the last couple of years which is very concerning to me, which is the live streaming and live tweeting while events are occurring, while Parkland was occurring. Instagram, when Parkland was occurring, I was actually giving a talk somewhere and my own kids were texting me saying, this, this stuff is live streaming on Instagram right now. Kids are under desks, et cetera, et cetera. So there's the, we, now we get into the safety and security issue. There are some schools that say no cell phones in the school because of all the crap that goes on and picture taking and all this posting and all this, right? right? And you have other schools that say, wait a minute, if something happens, cell phone, bam, I need to communicate with my parents or with someone. But they're not just communicating, they're live streaming events. And then other people pick up on this. They did this analysis based on 72 million tweets containing the word shooting or containing the word school. Over a million of them included school and shooting. So again, we need to be careful here, not just about the media coverage of these events after the fact, but of what kids are doing with social media around these incidents, around these possible incidents, and what they hear about, and what they're doing during these incidents, which can add to this contagion effect that other kids that see these things, the manifestos, the videos, the Sung Hui Cho in Virginia Tech, I'm going to videotape myself talking about these things, I'm going to write these long manifestos about what's going on and why. People are looking at this stuff over and over and over again as they plan their own incidents. So what are we talking about generally what to do here, right? <laughs> mental health. Everybody's going to mental health. I'm a clinician. I believe strongly in mental health. I believe strongly that we don't have enough mental health services in our schools, period. Is mental health the reason that these things are occurring and the singular solution to this issue? My answer would be no. I, I had this very specific conversation with uh, Ed Mulvey in Pittsburgh, who's a psychiatrist in Pittsburgh, has written about some of these things. Uh, said, look, this is the thing everybody can agree on. That's why it's getting a lot of play. It's hard to say we don't need more mental health supported services for our youth in schools, and nobody's going to say that's a bad thing. But what we have to be careful about is saying that's the thing, and it's the only thing. It's like bullying. I was part of a panel that did a National Academy's report on bullying two years ago. Bullying isn't the thing, and it's not the only thing. It's sometimes a thing, but it's not what they're talking about in terms of their motivations for doing these things. What the media says is going on and must be a reason because we're looking for good reasons. We're looking to rationalize why these things are happening to mostly say, well, then they're not going to happen here, right? Here's the conundrum with mental health, right? It's associated with doing this sort of thing. And what's the reasoning? Why did this young man, mostly man, male, do this terrible thing? Because he's mentally ill. Well, how do you know he's mentally ill? Because well, he did this thing. Who does this thing that isn't mentally ill, right? Now, we do have this burgeoning problem, I think. Early on, K-12 to shooters, almost no one, because they were their peers, right? There were these 14, 15, 16-year-old young men. Very, very few of them over decades had any known contact with the criminal justice system or law enforcement or mental health services. Until Columbine, right, where one of them had a known history. And then we are getting, now we're getting the adult perpetrators in public places and sometimes in schools that have pretty clear psychiatric histories. Sun Hui Cho was one of them. The person who shot uh, the congresswoman in Tucson, the person who perpetrated in the movie theater in Denver, 
go on and on, right? There are these older perpetrators who sometimes select schools as their target, even in Sandy Hook. That young man had identified issues that nobody did anything about or thought that they were going to lead to this. So see, there's a shift, I think, going on, and what the role of mental illness, untreated mental illness, might be playing here. But if you're a mental health person, you still have to stand by what we know, which is that the majority of persons with severe mental illness, or whatever the spectrum is, do not go out and commit violent crimes of any sort. In fact, they're much more likely to be victims of violence than perpetrators of violence. So standing on the table and pounding your fist and saying mental illness is the cause and addressing mental health is the solution singularly is just misguided. Now, is there an association? Is there the circular reasoning about mental health, etc.? Of course. And would I ever object to someone saying we want to put more resources into mental health in schools? Absolutely not. Just know what you're doing it for and what the impact you expect to have from it. And it needs to be part of a broader package. There is no specific profile, but Lamb in particular has written about different folks with different backgrounds that are well documented for older perpetrators for the most part. Okay? Mitchell Johnson was the young man who pulled the fire alarm and sat outside with a rifle and shot a number of people as they came out. I've talked about Sun Hui Cho a little bit. Um, Christina Anderson is on my National Advisory Board. She was a victim in the French classroom, shot three times. At, in the, the iconic picture of the young woman with the white t-shirt being carried out by first responders, that was her. Um, so she has a lot to say about how we handle these incidents and how we respond to them and people's long-term recovery. Eric Harris is the one person in Col at Columbine who, in retrospect, was really uh, psychopathic. And his writings and his journals of the violent themes and fantasizing and grandiosity and narcissism in his journal writings, which were discovered after the fact, uh, were quite alarming. So this comes into play when we talk about threat assessment. So look, mental health is an associated risk factor, but it's not a singular cause. We are still struggling with access to information. HIPAA, FERPA, all those things. Even within cases where we've identified a person who is a known threat. It's still the case. In most shootings, somebody else is told ahead of time. But when they occur, it's because nobody said anything or did anything about it. We're starting to get past the point of not taking these things seriously. So you're all, all of you who are clinicians and mental health people know that if a young person comes into your office and says, I'm going to kill myself, you are required to do something about that and take that seriously, whether you're a parent, a teacher, or a clinician, right? We're starting to get to the point where we take threats of interpersonal violence seriously as well, although I don't think we yet have the same kind of protocol of assessing risk like we would in a suicide attempt when we go through the... Have you tried it before? What's your plan? What did you do? What else is going on? Are these other... Very similar. I think we can do it if we had the wherewithal in specific cases. And we're just beginning to know about what successfully averted shootings look like. A guy by the name of Eric Madfis up in uh, Oregon has written a bit about this. What, what's going on when we actually stop a shooting from occurring? Look, we're still very few incidents. It's a low base rate. We got problems with um, trying to predict things from very small numbers. It's going to lead to way more false positives than false negatives, meaning we're going to take those 100 kids in first grade and take the 20 of them we think are really, really bad. They're all really, really bad in 16 or 18, but they're not all going to go shoot up a school or end up killing someone either. Um, most of them are going to turn out okay. And nobody in school has a, the time or resources to do a thorough psychiatric evaluation of anybody. So some of the models we're talking about have schools really contracting with their community-based mental health agencies more aggressively, if you will. Um, and we can't forget the risk of suicide versus interpersonal violence. Look, we just can't keep doing the same things, right? Bullying is a thing, but it's not the only thing. What we do in schools that affect climate and culture matter here in the long run. So the strategies we're talking about, we have to take this into account. 
high cultures of honor, valorization of violent masculinity, easier access to firearms, the media coverage, all these things play into when these things occur more frequently in some settings versus others. There's, there's growing data about this. So aside from mental health, what else are we doing? Columbine effect, harden the target. We're going to put in metal detectors, we're putting bars in the windows, we're going to put in bulletproof glass in our entryways, we're going to create a double entry system so that if someone suspicious comes in the first door, there's a second door they have to get in, right? Lock your doors. But there's some, there are simple things we can do, right? ID badges, sign-in processes, etc. Columbine effect. Everybody wants an SRO. Great, SROs can be really good. Are they always available to intercede if someone's going to come into your school with the intent of doing something violent? No. Physically, they can't be in every place at once. Typically, there's a law enforcement piece that they provide, of course. Uh, program provisions like DARE and GREAT, the substance use and gang resistance programs. Uh, and now, even in Ohio, we have statutes that say every school is supposed to have a PBIS team. Does everybody know what that is? Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports, right? It's not a program, it's a structure for how you address discipline and violence and the information you collect about it, and then what do you do about it? So it's, it's put forth as a framework for how you just do this. You do things with information, you don't just sort of make stuff up, and how you address these things, and whether you have, for example, a threat assessment team in place. But there are many common sense things you can do to make it harder for somebody to get into your building that don't cost a lot of money that a lot of schools just don't do. So start there. And understand, there is some data, by the way, that introducing an SRO into your school doesn't really result in good things. It results in more kids, particularly more minority kids, getting referred to the juvenile justice or adult criminal justice mm -hmm. system for what? many would consider relatively minor infractions that historically would have been addressed informally. But now you have a law enforcement officer there, you, you pissed me off? You did, you, you looking at me, what? You looking at me like that? No problem. That's her own. Take care of it. What's, what's your recourse? Uh, I, can, I can arrest them, I'm not a counselor, what am I supposed to do? Right? You're causing a problem, I'm off and off to the teacher, made a threat. Right? So there's a lot of evidence accumulating that SROs isn't just a thing, right? Arming teachers is now on the table. The U.S. Department of Education's most recent school safety report, released about six months ago, recommends that districts consider whether they should arm teachers and staff as a resolution here. What uh, these are the list of things you better be concerned about if you're going to go down that path, right? The need for intensive and ongoing training. Uh, what happens in a crisis? Our, my law enforcement colleagues can tell you all about responding in a crisis and people who are really well trained and still miss a lot. And, and when the adrenaline's flowing, etc. Let alone, you got a teacher running out of the building with a gun mm -hmm. and law enforcement responding. We've had a couple incidents like that already. Yes. Security guards and others who were shot by responding law enforcement officers, whether that's in a school or in a bar or whatever. You got all kinds of issues with teachers leaving guns in the restroom, kids pissed off picking up a gun. If you're going to do all the safety and security things, you got a firearm locked somewhere with ammunition locked somewhere else. These incidents are over in two minutes. <coughs> But you got rural school districts saying, I got 25, 30 minutes at best before anybody gets here. What else am I supposed to do? Throw hockey pucks, right, et cetera. Uh, so you have some school districts, particularly rural, that say, look, we have a culture of firearm violence and safety. Everybody's got a gun. That's what we're doing. So we have to be mindful I'm going to go back to what I said before. More guns in schools is not a good idea. It's going to increase rates of injuries and death, etc. But this is where the conversation is lying with our current administration. Remember this came up after Parkland and our president, somebody said we should arm teachers. That sounds like a good idea. Literally, it turned into the Safe School Commission that this was on their agenda before they even met, that this is one thing we're going to figure out how to put into our recommendations. So what they said is, consult with your local 
school district, parents, teachers, etc., address these issues in a thoughtful way. But if that's what you end up wanting to do, and you can handle the liability issues and the cost and the training and have people volunteer and don't tell anybody who's carrying, all that, which gets us into open carry laws in states now and protected communities, etc. So we'll see where that goes. So I'm going to end with um, a couple things. That this is our eight-point public health-oriented plan, and this this presentation can be available for whoever wants it. This was put together with a group of about 18 or 19 of us after Parkland. People that do work in this arena, uh, mass shooting, school violence prevention, endorsed by over five, 6,000 national organizations uh, to just say, look, if we're going to address this issue, let's at least agree we're going to take a public health oriented approach. There's prevention and education and awareness. There's stuff that we can do for at-risk kids that we know need help because they have mental health issues, etc. And there's certainly things we need to do for people that have already perpetrated an act. Right? So this isn't strictly just related to school-based shootings, but much of it is, and we've written about the school-specific aspects of this model. We've done this already, right? We've done this sort of approach with cars. Right? You have to get licensed and registered and relicensed and take a test and pass a thing, and right? We've done this before. We've put seat belts in and speed limits and stop signs and guardrails on our roads. So there's things we can do with firearms that we have not. There are things that are being out there that are out there that do work if you're willing to take a broad public health approach and not just an immediate reactive response to an incident. Socio-emotional learning programs, particularly those that focus on climate and connectedness in school. The kids that perpetrate these things are often sort of the rejected, neglected kids that don't feel a connection to an adult or to a group of peers. Threat assessment and bystander intervention. We've, we've heard a lot about this. Case has its ta a a team, right? Teams put in place to address threats of violence that can do a thorough assessment with a supportive approach to the issue, not, oh, let's get rid of this person and put them in directly into the criminal justice system necessarily. If you're just doing a threat assessment program because you're worried about school shootings, then you're kind of wasting your time and effort. If you look at violent incidents across the spectrum of what you might be dealing with, including risk for suicide, as well as perpetrating harm against others, then threat assessment teams can be an effective tool to be used, particularly in the larger districts. These are sort of district level teams, not school building level threat assessment. You can have your own little threat assessment with your school resource officer, your school counselor, and your vice principal dealing with these incidents as they occur. But there's also more formal threat assessment. Bystander intervention is a thing, right? This comes from Moms Demand Action and other Sandy Hook, see something, say something kinds of approaches. School resource officers can be great as long as they're trained appropriately and, and know what their role is. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to go through this. There's steps to doing threat assessment. All I'll say is that many adolescents have many of these issues, which is why we need to be careful. But I do think the fascination with firearms, with easy access, and the writings or internet social media access around violent themes and other <coughs> kinds of activity is the kind of stuff that puts it over the edge, right? Beyond just being depressed or having issues with coping with stressful things, etc. cetera. Um, one of our state legislators just said the other day that it's school testing in the spring that causes mass shootings in schools. I kind of think I know where that statement comes from when we talk about kids getting stressed out and not being able to cope, but I would certainly disagree with a direct correlation between school <laughs> testing and mass shooting. Um, so I do think it's this, you know, history of trauma and the writings and drawings of violent themes is really different than anybody else. Bystander intervention is a thing. One of the things I told my daughter in Chicago when I dropped her off for freshman year, I said, um, you know, be safe, have a good time, and don't ever go upstairs at a frat party. <laughs> so, uh, and I was being serious. So, um, when you see something, say something. That's where that comes from, the whole dating violence and uh, framework. So there are a lot of programs out there, and I, I know even recently Alice has been called out uh, because we're doing these things. NPR just put something out the other day about these drills, these real life or close to real 
circumstance drills that we're putting kids through in order to be prepared, right? So there's a camp that says we need to do everything we can to be prepared like we used to do nuclear uh, bomb drills when we were kids, when some of us were kids. Uh, now we're doing active shooter drills. They have to be developmentally appropriate. And we have to question whether putting, you know, third graders through these things is the right thing to do, just particularly the in vivo type incidents, which is, we've heard stories, right, where people are freaking out when these are unannounced drills, and then uh, people are having mental health breakdowns because of this. I, I really like, I, you know, here we go, right, Sandy Hook, I thought the kids were going to have a voice and people were going to start listening to the young people. Moms demand action after Parkland, as well as the youth voice. Uh, I, don't, I get asked this a lot, what's it going to take to get people to do something in this space? Even common sense, something that 90% of us all agree on. I, I don't have a good answer, since, since we, since we haven't done anything yet after Las Vegas, after Dayton, our own Republican governor has had to back off 300% off of his original proposals for background checks and red flag laws. Um, we know that zero tolerance doesn't work. Just expelling kids because you're concerned about them does not work as a discipline strategy because we, we expel them to nothing. That's part of the problem. Um, we need to know more about the suicide-homicide link. And I think there are these emerging issues with what, was, what goes on in K-12 schools and perpetrators versus higher ed adult perpetrators that are much more uh, likely to have mental health issues. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with two quick slides. These are recommendations that I had in this paper that I briefly mentioned before with, with uh, Jamie Fox and these folks that's coming out around school firearm violence in schools. This is pretty much the list that I wrote and then I was told to take it out because they only wanted things that have an had an evidence base to them, a research base that could be cited for why you would do these things. So I'm going to share them with you anyway because <laughs> uh, we don't have any research on most of these things because of what I said at the very beginning, right? Yeah. So, number one, let's support some common sense gun laws and policies that limit access to firearms to people that shouldn't have them, particularly very young people and people with serious um, issues. All right? Vote. What's the evidence behind telling people they should vote? Vote for the people at the local and federal levels who you think will back up this legislation. That's who makes our laws and policies. Simple. I don't have a reference for you, just a recommendation. <laughs> Background checks. 90% of our country says background checks should be in place. Nobody says you can't buy 10, but who says you should get to buy 10 within 30 minutes because you want to? Why can't you wait 24 hours or 48 hours? And who says we can't have a reliable background check system that's got information in there that it's supposed to have in there? Right? So just make it better. It's a paper-driven system right now. For all, you're not allowed to have a list of who owns what firearms in this country. You're not allowed to keep that information. It's against the law. Right? So you can't find out. You can find out who bought it, but you can't necessarily find out who currently has it or might have used it in a crime. Low-cost safety measures, lock your doors, get name tags, etc. <coughs> Become an advocate. Well, what's the research on becoming an advocate? Well, the more voices. We haven't figured it out, right? Us adults haven't figured this damn thing out. So let the kids tell us what we need to do in schools to make this better. Because they're the ones who are afraid. All the data I showed you skipped over the 60% of kids are freaked out. Anytime something like this happens, kids and parents stop going to school because they're afraid. So whether the reality and the numbers tell you it's a low thing, a low risk thing, the perception of fear and safety is a big deal. So I think uh, this is where Scott Frank gets this credit for this bullet point. He said, tell them to put an item on the YRBS that assesses student concerns for safety and their fear around these incidents so that we can talk about having to address their fear and anxiety on a day-to-day -day basis and not just depend on the actual data. Um, so he, he gets that credit. Encourage and support youth voice. Don't underestimate social media. Get away from these singular simplistic solutions. What we're doing right now is not working. 
So whatever else it is, let's do something else. Let's turn it on its ear about how we address this. And this is what Bill Mozeliski said. Well, simply, if you stop somebody or delay them getting into your building, you're going to go a long way to preventing the significance and seriousness of these incidents. So um, you should at least do what you can do, right? You don't need a ton of money to do some simple things. Make decisions with community and staff input, including your kids, about what you're doing. This gets into you know, the rural communities and what they can do here, because first responders aren't very close. Um, should you have a substation in your school? I mean, we talk about community-based policing. We talk about school resource officers. I got to tell you, I do a fair bit of training with my law enforcement colleagues. Not every law enforcement officer is the best school resource officer, mm -hmm. right? You need to be have the right perspective, the right training, the right ongoing training to be effective and know what your role is and how you can support what's going on. So for all the increased calls for SROs as one of the solutions, again, I would not be against it. I'm, I'm supportive of it in the right circumstances with the right training and supports and identifying the right people who should be in our schools. So look, there's a lot now out there even in the last couple of years. There's reports that try to combine databases on mass shootings and school shootings. There's reports on mental health uh, issues related to firearm violence. There's things coming out of the CDC and the Department of Education about what we do around school safety and security. I, you know, Always understand that depending on where the report is coming from, there may be political motivations behind what the recommendations might be. Look at the things that are national organizations that have been in this space for a very long time. Social work, parent-teacher organizations, school psychologists, etc. What they're saying about this. You know, when kids and teachers talk about what's going on in their schools, I listen very closely. When a teacher has 25 or 30 years of experience, um, about what to do here. So we can't just make this a top-down policy driven, this is what we're telling you you need to do to solve your problem. We need to do a little bit more bottom-up and get folks together at the local level and say, tell us what will work for you. How do we figure that out? But there's a lot, you want to read, there's just a lot out there now about this issue. There's new money going to be available for gun violence research from the CDC, but not much. Um, so we'll see where this goes. But if I had to say one thing about this, I, well, I, let me say two things. One, vote. It's not going to change unless we get other people in there that are willing to represent their constituencies, even for the most basic common sense things, like universal background checks or red flag, red flag laws, right? Uh, number two, listen to our kids and get them involved. You know, what's, what's the harm in that, right? Those would be my two takeaways. I'm going to stop there. I'll take any questions, qualms, queries, quirks, quips, quandaries. <laughs> I have two questions for you. And I want to say thank you for coming out. Thank you for being here. Um, my first question is, where can we find all of this data that you had? I cite the reports on the slides. These are sort of... Um, you know, if you just Google mass shootings, you're going to get a whole list of reports that different organizations have put out. Every Town for Gun Safety, the Brady Campaign, Mother Jones, uh, NPR has done a number of things. The Washington Post has done a number of things. Some, of, Many of them of the national organizations are listed in this additional resources list. So again, I'm happy to share this so that you can look them up. Okay, so my, thank you. So my second question is, do you have any experience in knowing what does it look like for a fire drill or a security drill for the schools of the students that have noise disorders? What does it look like? It, it's visual, meaning the flashing lights are mm -hmm. in place. I have a, one of my daughter, one of my daughters is uh, hearing impaired. So yeah, that's a consideration. You can't just say, go do this necessarily. So that's the, that's the kind of conversation about, you know, it's hard to tell a school that they have to be accommodating to every possible permutation and com combination of everything, but certainly visual versus auditory response is a big one. Kent State had an active shooter a few years ago, right after they went through Alice training, and it was about their communi auditory communications across buildings and things that was very helpful to them. 
uh, and in some of the early events, the actual communication channels didn't work. There are multiple channels, first responders were all using something else. Mm -hmm. So again, you need auditory and visual signage, things like that. I think we could do preparedness drills without freaking everybody out. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. right? We do fire drills. Yeah, same thing. Where, this is where you go if something happens. Mm -hmm. the, big, the big controversy, frankly, is the, you know, what do you do first, right? Well, get the hell out of there if you can. Mm -hmm. But you gotta assess where you're at. Number one, and then the whole emphasis on Alice is well, if you have a last resort, then fight back. There's people, you know, generally people that have started, <coughs> sat and waited, like Columbine, didn't work, right? You can't wait for a few hours for law enforcement to respond. So there's a, you know, but look, frankly, my wife's a special ed teacher. If somebody came into her school, she'd have a way different response with her students and her role than I might as a college professor with 20 adults. <coughs> Well, I might meet twice. College campuses are meant to be open, right? You don't want to lock every building, etc. Go out west to our elementary schools. They're spread out. They're like motels with little buildings, all single-story buildings. There's open access, open everything. It's not just one building contained, you know, and you know where all the entrances and exits are. Um, I do know some of our, uh, we do uh, studies and some of our testers or our observers were observing classrooms when there was a threat, not a, re it wasn't real, but right. well, they thought it was a threat. But the children did know how to handle it, more calm. The observers who had never been trained and been through those sessions yeah. Good. were freaking out. And so those kids, they, they, the observers, you know, you really need to get behind the desk. Right, and this I think is what we training do. Training them yeah. has to help a lot. You could do it in the right way, and mm -hmm. it can be helpful. That's my, you know, so you're going to do these things. Do it thoughtfully, and gather as much information about what your situation and circumstances and facilities are. Even the simple things like knowing what the layout of the building is is an improvement over what we did before, where you'd show up and nobody knew where to go or, mm -hmm. you know, what the access points were. Yes, good to see you again. Um, you spoke to, as uh, far as um, the, the entrance to the schools, mm -hmm. the people getting into um, the schools. Um, Bolton Elementary, which is right in the Fairfax community, they have a magnetometer. Um, they have um, a security officer that is right there at the door every day and going through book bags. Uh, what, what would you suggest? Look, every school is a little different in terms of the level of incidents that they're dealing with and their concern. Uh, here's the conundrum, right? As a parent, you don't want your kid going to a secure facility as if it were a prison. But you also want your kids to be safe. We also know <coughs> anecdotally that if somebody's really intent on perpetrating harm, they're gonna find a way to get a weapon into that, into that space. Um, I guess I would say that if you had to use a magnometer, you, you don't necessarily need to do it every day. You can do it right randomly. Um, you can also do mobile <coughs> scans so you don't have all the machines in the front of the entrance. I think there's ways to secure your, first of all, make sure all your doors are locked, right? So you don't have somebody coming to the back door. Um, or kids letting people in that shouldn't be let in, right? I, I, I'm, I don't think we're in a position to say to some, to take the extremes on this in any event, to say you shouldn't have a metal detector in your school. I'm like, dude, we have, you know, kids caught with firearms, you know, three times a week. So that's what we're going to do. Because if we don't, it's going to be way worse. So we'll deal with the climate culture issues in a different way, but, but we're not, not doing that. I mean, who, who am I to say that you shouldn't? All I, all I would say is if you're going to take that approach, make sure you're doing some other things too. It's not the only thing you're doing or that you don't think it's the only thing you have to do. Right? Understand the impact of what you're doing. When you put an SRO in a school, know what that means for your school and how that's going to impact the climate and culture of your school. When you're putting cameras up, know that people habituate to that stuff. Cameras are an after-the-fact, what happened here thing, not a proactive preventive measure. So people that think putting cameras up is hardening the target is a big deal. It only works for a short period of time and then it's, right? Same thing with, you know, shot spotter and things like that. We might be able to get someplace quicker because we heard shots going off, but cameras are mostly reactive after the fact information. Sight lines, simple things. So SEPTED is crime prevention through environmental design, right? If there are simple things you can do, get rid of that big ass tree in front of the front door because you can't see anybody that's coming in. 
right? The problem we had here at the Peter B. Lewis building, right? It's all curved. You can't, you can't. That's a that's a design issue when somebody's standing up at the top, you know, over the railing, shooting down on people. So just be, we need to be thoughtful about it. There's just no there's no singular solution that I can stand here and say, do this and you'll be fine. There's also no gold standard of a package of things other than say, look, be thoughtful about these multiple things you couldn't, you can do. Not everything is expensive. Not everything is a, you know, people are going to rise up and say, what the hell are you talking about? Be thoughtful. Gather information. Communicate with your partners in the community and understand what you're doing and why and what the potential impact of it is. I can't care. You know, the only thing I can guarantee right now today in this room, another one is going to happen. There's going to be another mass shooting in this country. Sometime. I don't know if it's going to be tomorrow or two months from now. That's the only thing I'm sure of, unfortunately, is that we're going to have another one. There's going to be another one in the school. There's going to be another one in another place. What are we going to do about it? How, when, are we, when are we going to do something about it? If it isn't Sandy Hook and it isn't Las Vegas and it isn't Parkland, What's this going to take? We, did we ever even ban bump stocks? Did we get that through? Or that was proposed and never passed, right? So, Yes, they were. They were? They were thank you. I appreciate it. A colleague from APF. Um, I have a question. Yeah. From like a global context, looking at other nations with similar population demographics and things, how does, I mean, obviously the U.S. is way worse. The studies that I've looked at that others have done and compared, if you control, as I said earlier, mm -hmm. poverty and SES, education levels, the amount of money you put in mental health, rates of mental illness, go down the list. Uh, the only thing that stands out in terms of our rates of firearm violence are predicted by the number of firearms we have relative to other countries. Mm -hmm. Look, Australia's done a number of things with buybacks and after some of their incidents, and our, you know, we just say we, we don't have the capacity or the will to do that, or the political will to do that, or really the capacity to do that. Um, and I, there's only a limited data on the assault weapons ban, right? So somebody, people will say, well, our rates of violent crime, fire and violence didn't go down when we banned assault weapons, so why ban them? Or there are so many of them out there, what's the point when we never get them all back? So, you know, we've, we've been well versed now in the sort of uh, response to these incidents of the slippery slope argument. I don't care if what you're proposing makes sense and everybody wants to do it, we're just not going to do it because that's the first step towards five other things that are going to happen. So, yes, sir. I've heard that violent video games don't have anything to do with this. What, did, what have you heard and what do you think? So, very little. Most perpetrators that survive tell us that they didn't watch a violent video and then go out and decide to do this or listen to violent music and go out and decide to do this. So again, is what I'm, am I comfortable with an at-risk youngster who's got lots of issues and anger issues and impulse control problems to say, sit down and play whatever it is these days, Mortal Kombat, or you know, we grew up with Big Moro and you know, we turned out sort of okay. But uh, so would I, would I say that's no big deal? No, but it's like it's the same bullying, right? There's no singular thing that's the easy solution that if we just got rid of violence in the media, kids aren't going to do this stuff. That's the best I could say. So if you have an adverse kid you're worried about, you don't want to add that block to the tower that's going to make it topple over and let them do whatever they want. I'm curious um, if you have a sense of like private industry, because when it comes to American culture, often large corporations can push issues in a way when we aren't successful voting, let's say, right? Like uh, when it comes to cultural. Yeah, look at the um, stores that took firearms off their shelves. Well, that's right? what I'm curious. Walmart and Dick's and. Do you have a sense the of if there's been news in that space? If you know, like as consumers, it's a different type of advocacy that we have, and sort of where we are in that. I think there's been a little bit on both sides. Some people applauding those uh, retailers for taking you know that stand, and others saying we'll never shop in your store ever again since you this option away from us. Um, I, I certainly think it's about, there's certainly money involved in all of this, right? The manufacturers of these, um, of firearms, etc. I I can tell you that when we try to reach out to corporations like Facebook and others around violent media and streaming and things, around the bullying thing, 
we got one response to participate in our uh, meetings, and that was uh, PBS. <laughs> so uh, nobody else wanted to talk about how they deal with the violent content and you know, how they screen for it, etc. They say they're doing it. I believe they're doing it. Um, but I also, you know, I, I read what you read, read, right? So in the most current climate, they're allowing certain things, you know, on their sites that they know to be not accurate because it generates revenue, I suppose, or it's or it's free speech, right? But the technology involved, where you can make something look real that isn't real, is certainly a concern. Um, I don't, I don't know if that answers your question, but. I, I apologize for walking in late. That's right. You know we're going for that one. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and did you did you talk about ACEs at all? Mm -hmm. uh, about risk yeah. assessment, like the adverse childhood yes. experiences? Yeah. No, not really. I talked briefly about threat. That would be part of a threat assessment model. Um, ACEs is recently coming under a little bit of scrutiny for is it all that, right? Can you really do nine things um, and, and get all the information you need? In this space, probably not. There's more going on than that. Um, but we did talk about threat assessment and um, broadening the scope beyond the typical things, particularly around trauma, violence victimization, um, other circumstances. Uh, for kids that are at risk in this space, and adults. I, I mentioned earlier the adult perpetrators that do have clear psychiatric illnesses involved untreated mental illness in some of these mass shootings over the last half a dozen years. Whereas historically, most kids had no evidence or by age, you know, they haven't gotten there yet, or um, they just weren't involved in the criminal justice system. No, no identified history anyway. I think that's changing. Um, how do you engage people or convince people that like the solution to the problems like gun violence isn't a violation of their rights when people come to the next second moment is a violation? Right. How do you have that conversation with the facts? Well, first of all, I try to I try to stay. I said whatever your as I briefly alluded to before, whatever your position is on the Second Amendment, we're we're not talking about taking away your rights. We're just talking about. You want a background check? If you want people to not have firearms that you don't think should have firearms, then, then let's agree to a background check. The answer is typically, I've, you know, I have a lot of friends that have a lot of firearms. They said, "Don't take mine away. Take it away from that crazy. Don't don't do anything that's going to affect me." So, I try to stick to what we know. And to, this is a look. You, we go to our extremes very quickly on this issue on gun violence, right? And it gets in. So I I try as best I can to stay in the middle and just talk about what we know and what we need to consider relative to which way you want to go on something. I'm, I'm not standing up here and saying take everybody's guns away. I am saying what we know is that the more guns there are out there, the more stuff happens. In domestic violence situations, and people under the influence, in accidents, etc., etc. You want to put more guns in schools? Things are going to happen, even if you train people really well. So that's what I'm here to say. And that's what the data tells us in terms of injury, unintentional injury, intentional injury, talk to any ER doc, you know, they'll, they'll tell you that this is what's going on. So, we, you know, we, we have some limits, right? We can't go out and buy a bazooka, but you can go out and get an assault rifle. Mm -hmm. we, so we've chosen that that's okay. And the argument is for sport, and because I want to have it. I, I don't know. I, I don't know if there's an official position on any of this. I made a comment earlier about our background checks or system is pretty inadequately uh, set up and our ability to check firearms and track them is pretty limited and paper driven for the most part. I don't want to put ATF on the spot here. But, well, I wouldn't have shown up if I, if yeah. I wasn't. <laughs> no, you, do you want the, the 30 second answer? Sure. So That is our ASAC and ATF. I've, I've been an ATF agent for more than two decades and I started with the Department of Justice 28 years ago. Um, I hope I don't look as old as I feel mm. on any given day. Um, Relative to some of us, you're like, <laughs> <laughs> appreciate that. Um, look, when I started with ATF, uh, you know, the, the national instant background check NICS that we have right now didn't exist. Um, that that came that came in the late 90s. Before that, whenever you bought a gun, you just filled out the paperwork at the gun store, and that's where it stayed. You could have lied on the form, you could have been a criminal, you name it. There, that that's the way it lived. Now. Whenever there's a transaction at a gun store, you fill out the form, they call FBI, FBI runs the background check. And so what the, what the doctor's alluding to, 
that that is only as good as the information that's in it. And all that information is based on what the state and local departments tell us what happened. So if somebody gets arrested but they don't update the conviction information, what do we do? How does that get held? And then there's only three days. So you go to buy a gun. Let's say there's something in your background that's kind of that they're trying to research. After that 72-hour period, that gun that gun store can just let that that gun go. And now the background check continues after that point. And if you are found to pro be prohibited, that's when they call us and they tell us to go get the gun. <laughs> Who wants that job? <laughs> Somebody's got to do it. Um, you know, there, there are personal sales of firearms in this country, and that's where we're talking. When we're talking about universal background checks, you're talking about everything that happens outside of, of a gun store. Different states have had different remedies to that. California treats it very differently than Ohio does. Um, you know, and, and but once again, it, you know, there's certain things the states do, and there's certain things we do federally. Um, one of the references, uh, there's nine prohibitors federally for, for possession of a firearm. Everybody talks about felon in possession, that's the big one, but the other one that gets a lot of when you talk about red flags, it's an adjudicated um, mental issue. Okay, It's a very specific definition, not all things count, and we don't have all those records because states consider that HIPAA. So we only get what the states give us on that. I've, I've personally worked cases over the year where police respond to an incident, neighbors and families say, hey, this guy's got an issue, we got to go dig through court records, we got to go dig through medical records, we got to find it because there's no central repository for that. Um, there is, you know, the system is as we find it. Uh, and, you know, the, the personal sales, you know, we're talking about gun shows, you're talking about internet transactions. Um, you know, there, there, there's no requirements for a background check on it. That's just the way it is. Um, to your earlier comment about a gun registry, prohibited federally, states can take a different approach to it. Um, I just worked in Michigan for a while. Michigan actually has, for, for handguns, um, every time it changes hands, you're supposed to notify the state. South Carolina used to have something like that. They got rid of it years ago. So it's, it's a very complicated um, regulatory and legal system. Mm -hmm. Up and down. But that, that's a short answer. There's a couple holes in what I say. But I'm trying to make it as, as yeah. succinct as possible. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's really helpful. I mean, you know, and remember Ohio is still a rural state, pretty much, right? Mm -hmm. It's not an urban state. It's a rural state. And uh, our legislature is going in the, in the direction of, you know, easier access and open carry and things like that. So. That's what I said. If you really want to see some conversation at the local, at the state, particularly in federal levels, <coughs> who we have in our legislatures that are having these conversations. Um, the ministerial. The ministerial. Right? <laughs> different different problem. I think we're up against our time. So if anybody has any last-second comment or question, um, otherwise I'll say have a good day and be safe. Thank you for coming. Thank you.